And welcome to the X Zone, everyone. My name is Rob McConnell, and we're coming to you from our broadcast center and studios in Crystal Beach, Ontario, Canada. Now, if you'd like to send me an email, X Zone at X Zone Radio TV dot com on all social media sites, X Zone Radio TV. And for the programming schedule that we have available for you uh, with our programming 24 7, 365, visit xzbn.net. And for the X Zone TV channel on Simul TV, www.simultv.com. X Zone Nation, my guest this hour is Dr. Scott Kolbaba, and he is the author of Physicians Unstol- Untold Stories. His website is www.physiciansuntoldstories.com. And Dr. Kolbaba is an internist in private practice in Wheaton, Illinois. He graduated from the University of Illinois College of Medicine with honors and did his residency at Rush Presbyterian St. Luke's Medical Center in Chicago and at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. He has uh, been awarded membership in the Alpha Omega Alpha Honor Medical Society and has been featured in the Chicago Magazine as a top doctor in internal medicine. Joining me now is Dr. Scott Kolbaba. And, Doctor, welcome to the Exxon. Thanks, Rob. It's great to be here. Uh, your book has a very interesting title, Physicians Untold Stories. Tell us a little bit about the title and what was your inspiration in writing this book? Well, the title comes because there are so many doctors that, that uh, have unusual stories mm-hmm. that don't share them. We doctors don't talk about uh, deep subjects very much. We talk about golf butters and uh, our golf game and, right. and uh, what we're doing on the weekend, but uh, the stories that I happened to collect were really, really very deeply spiritual and, and unusual uh, stories. And I was very surprised because I'd been in practice for about 25 years before I even started to hear some of these stories. Mm. And so I thought that the title of the book would be very appropriate as Physicians Untold Stories because these are basically untold. And the reason they are is the physicians were afraid that they would lose their patience or lose their credibility when they shared some of these supernatural experiences with me. What was the first story that you were told by a patient that was the the idea for everything you've done since that very first encounter with that patient? I think one of the first stories that I had was a, a fellow, ta- uh, Taylor uh, Manning was his mm-hmm. name, and Taylor um, uh was traveling outside the, the state, and he called me up because he was having some right upper abdominal pain. And I said, you know, it sounds like gallbladder. It was typical after eating. And I said, you better, better get to the emergency room, which he did. They saw him in the emergency room. They did all the tests, and it was all negative. Hmm. <clears throat> and they gave him some, some uh, narcotic, and he seemed to get better. But I said, you know, when you come home, Taylor, let's, let's take, a, uh, take a look at you and make sure that you're okay. So he came home. He was still having the pain. Mm-hmm. So at that point, I ordered some of their sophisticated tests, thinking that, you know, the hospital didn't do all the right tests, and I ordered some fancier tests, and everything came back normal. And he was still having a great deal of pain, right upper abdomen, again, very typical for gallbladder. And so I didn't quite know what to do with him, but uh, it was really unusual. After about three or four days, after a couple of additional tests, I woke up in the morning thinking, I have to call him this morning and talk with him. And that's really unusual. It was about 6 o'clock, 6.30 in the morning. So I called, <laughs> I called him up. I'm sure I woke him up. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about you. And I'm, I, I had this idea that you need a lung scan. And he said, well, that's kind of unusual because this is an abdominal pain. Why would I need a lung scan? And I said, right. I just had this, this feeling, this overwhelming feeling that I couldn't get out of my, out of my system. So he said, well, I can't do it today because I'm flying off to Denver. And so I didn't know quite what to do. I, I said, when, when, do you, when does your flight leave? And he said, about 2.30 in the afternoon. So I said, if I can get you the, the scan first thing in the morning, would you go for it? He, he paused for quite a while and finally said, okay. So I called the radiology department. I told them what I was looking for. They kind of laughed at me you know, for doing a lung scan for a person with abdominal pain, but they decided to go ahead with me. So they told him to come right over. He went over there, and about an hour later, I got a call from the radiologist radiologist said, nice call, Scott. How'd you think of a lung scan? And I said, I just woke up this morning and thought about it. And he said, well, you probably saved his life. He had a massive pulmonary embolus oh sitting gosh. on his diaphragm on the right side of his lung. Had we not done the lung scan and he flew off to Denver, he might not have s- survived. How did that affect you personally, Dr. Scott? I was really shaken up. Uh, you know, you get weak knees when these kinds of things happen to you and mm-hmm. you get the goosebumps and, yeah. and you think, boy, there's something else that was looking after, uh, out for him and out for me that morning when I woke up. 
And so after that, uh, I, you know, you let that pass and, you know, it, it, mm-hmm. it, it impresses you for a while. But then, you know, the busyness of life takes on and uh, the, the usual humdrum of things. But then a couple of their docs came to me with unusual stories that, that I've never uh, heard before. And after I heard those stories, I thought, I better write these down. This is so incredible. And I wondered if other, sto- other doctors had stories like those also. And I started asking, and I was very, very surprised in my interviewing with two or three hundred doctors that many doctors had unusual experiences. And the ones that gave me goosebumps or made me tear up were the ones I put in the book. Two or three hundred doctors. Now, if they were the stories that you were told by them, can you just imagine how many untold other stories there are out there? There have to be millions. Yeah. And what I've learned too, Rob, is that it's not just the doctors that have these stories. I think in talking with my patients, and I love to tell these stories to my patients. I always get behind in the office when I'm telling these <laughs> stories. But, but I've found that when I tell these stories, and frequently, uh, or frequently, I should say, many patients will say, well, you know, it's neat that you told me that story because I had one like that or my mother had one like this. Yeah. And it's amazing how many people have had these supernatural, miraculous, spiritual experiences that, that they're all also afraid to tell. You know, here you are, a, medic, a Western medical practitioner, highly recognized as, as a professional. You've spoken to two, three hundred other doctors in the Western medical field who have had these experiences. How do you, sir, how do you, or can you even explain how these happen? Well, the doctors uh, have their own explanations, and I think most, and I do too, and I think mm-hmm. most of the doctors would say, these are divine interventions from God. Okay. And, and you can believe what you want. You can believe a, a force is out there, that these the universe. But most of the docs that I talked with said this was just an intervention from God, and it saved someone or saved me, or it did uh, incredible things to, to uh, move something along. I believe in divine intervention. So, you know, I can fully understand that. How did the other doctors feel about revealing these stories to you, knowing full well that... They were going to be published. Did they fear ridicule? Did they fear retribution from other members of the profession? Absolutely, absolutely. These are these are in unusual stories. And the docs that I interviewed, mm-hmm. I, I've known for many, many years. Some of them over thirty years. My goodness. And I picked the docs that I knew were straight arrow docs, kind of boring at parties. You know, they just they just you know <laughs> like to do their work. They uh, were great doctors. They had. No, no reason to gain anything from telling these stories. And so they were, they were all very hesitant to tell me. As a matter of fact, Dave Mokel, who's a great orthopedic surgeon, uh, who told me one of the first stories, uh, ran up to me in the, in the hallway, and he said, Scott, I've got to tell you this story about a mutual patient. And I said, well, okay, Dave, go ahead and tell me. And he said, well, I can't tell you, I can't tell you here. Someone might hear me. So we had to go into a, a private room uh, in the, on the floor. Where there, were, there were no patients in the room. And he went on to explain an incredible story. And I said, well, Dave, who did you tell this story to already? And he said, my wife, and that's it, no one else. And so that's kind of what the, uh, the theme was for, for the doctors. They were afraid that something would happen to them. And then the next question, Rob, obviously is, well, why did they let me publish these stories if they were afraid that people would, exactly. you know, would, would, would leave their practice or the doctors would shun them and so forth? I think... One of the things I discovered about docs, and again, it was really fun to interview these doctors because I was able to really get into the into the heart of a doctor, the soul of a doctor, as to what makes them tick. And I think the thing that they expressed to me was that they wanted to make a difference in the world. They wanted people to know that there's something else out there. Right. And that desire to be what I called sappy do-gooders was, <laughs> was greater than the fear of losing their practices and losing their, their, their colleagues. And as it turned out, no one was shunned by their patients. No, no colleagues were, were, um, were ostracized. Right. Uh, it, it turned out to be the greatest thing that ever happened because many, many patients have come up to me and other doctors and said, thank you for telling these stories because now we feel better us, ourselves about sharing our own stories and our family stories. So it's turned out to be just the opposite of what we were afraid of. All right, please stand by, Dr. Scott. You and I have to take our first break. And Dr. Nation, if you'd like to get uh, more information or buy this book, it's a great book for the Christmas season. And I must tell you, I've had the opportunity of going to Dr. Scott's website. It's fantastic. 
Check it out at www.physiciansuntoldstories.com. And uh, Dr. Scott Cole Baba and I will be back on the other side of this commercial break as we continue here in the X Zone from our broadcast center and studios in Crystal Beach, Ontario, Canada. I'm Rob McConnell. Don't go away. Welcome back, everyone. Dr. Scott Cole Baba is our special guest to this hour. He is the author of Physicians Untold Stories, his website, physiciansuntoldstories.com. Over the years, uh, Dr. Scott, ha- has there been one story that you have heard, whether it is from one of your own patients or one of your colleagues' patients, that has just kind of shaken you? Yes, yeah, there, there, are, there are a couple. Okay. Um, two that I love. Particularly, uh, let me tell you one about uh, Graham O'Hanlon. Okay. Graham O'Hanlon, uh, now this is about Dr. Jack Heitzler, who's a gynecologist mm-hmm. and obstetrician. He's delivered two of our babies, and the babies have actually grown up and are normal people. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, Jack was uh, in the delivery room with his wife. His wife was delivering their fifth child. And um, uh, Graham O'Hanlon, who was a midwife uh, and Joan's grandmother, stepped in and saved Joan's life. And the story goes something like this. When Joan was a little girl, her grandmother uh, went to live with her when she couldn't uh, uh, deliver babies anymore. She was a midwife in Chicago. And Joan and grandmother became very close, an uh, incredibly uh, loving relationship. And Joan would kid around and say, if I could make it to Grandma Hanlon's lap, uh, I'd, al- I'd always be <laughs> safe from my mother, who uh, would sometimes get in trouble with her mother. And so Joan was delivering their, their fifth child. And after the delivery, there was some retained placenta, and so she had to have a, an additional procedure, and she was starting to have a lot of pain. So at the time, uh, they decided to give her a, a drug called Trilene, which is a mask that goes over the face, and it, it puts a woman into deep sleep, and they can do the procedure, and, and uh, then they take it off, and, and within a few minutes, it's, it's gone. Right. And so uh, they were ready to put the mask over Joan's face to give her the anesthesia. When Grandma Hanlon stepped into the room, uh, little old Grandma Hanlon was dressed in her typical white polka dot dress, a little sweater vest on, her hair up in the bun, white hair up in the bun, little old lady shoes. And she stood at the foot of the bed and shook her head uh, and said, you know, basically, Joan, don't, don't do that. So Joan pushed the, the mask away. And she didn't know why, and, and uh, so, uh, you know, she had to suffer a little bit with the pain. But uh, no one realized that Joan had eaten a very large meal right before she went into labor. And about 30 seconds after she pushed the mask away, she vomited the entire meal. Ooh. Had she been in deep sleep, you can imagine, Rob, what would have happened. She'd have aspirated all that vomitus and, and might have died from an aspiration pneumonia. So Joan says that she made it back to Grandma, and Grandma O'Hanlon's lap one last time, having transcended time and eternity, because Grandma O'Hanlon had died 22 years before. My heavens. That's one of my favorite stories. Can you give us another one, sir? Sure. The one I like, too, is, is about, well, this is one of the first ones I heard. This was uh, from Steve Heim, who is an orthopedic surgeon. And uh, this is a, a more uh, this is a this is a fun story because Steve is a great uh, orthopedic surgeon. He's a, uh, also a trauma surgeon, and Steve was kind of burned out from the busyness of, of life and the busyness busyness of the practice. So he decided to take his wife and his wife's sister on a skiing trip to Colorado, and they were they're expert skiers. And Steve is particularly good at anything in athletics. So they were going down this this mountain they'd never been down before. And when they got to the top of the mountain, there was a sudden blizzard that hit. That's The temperature dropped about 40 degrees. The wow. snow is coming down so hard they could hardly see more than 10 feet in front of them. But they had to ski down, so they started skiing. And Steve and, and the girls were skiing together as much as they could see each other. And then they came to a grove of trees, and they could all go to the right or the left. Steve decided to go to the right, and he thought the girls were with him, but they happened to go to the left following a group of other people. 
when Steve realized that they were on the other side of the grove of trees, he decided to ski through this five feet of powder snow, which, again, he's an expert skier. That was no problem at all. And as he's skiing, he suddenly had uh, this feeling, this premonition, this unusual feeling. It was in his chest, like something was, was being told to, to, to him, and he didn't know quite what it was. And all of a sudden, he said, things got very still and very quiet, despite the wind blowing like crazy, the snow coming down sideways and upside down. It was a very eerie silence. He could hear himself breathe. He could hear the skis and the snow. And he decided then that he didn't know what to do, but he decided to stop. So he stopped skiing right in the middle of this grove of the trees. Now, he didn't know why the heck he stopped. And then he took off his skis and stood there for a minute. Again, it was this eerie silence. And it was a feeling that he was being called to do something that had life and death implications and had no idea what it was. So he started to then climb up the mountain. Now, this is in the opposite direction of where the girls were actually waiting for him. He couldn't see the girls, but he knew that they were on the other side of the grove of trees. And he's climbing up this mountain, climbing and walking and climbing in mountains. It's a steep mountain. And he came to a big tree, and under the tree, there's like a, a tree well. You'd know from Canada what those look like. Yes. Uh, it, was, it was a big well that goes down to the base of the tree. Mm -hmm. And he stood there wondering what the heck he's doing here. And again, it's very quiet, and he has this feeling in his chest. And then he looked down, and he knew why he was there. Covered with snow, under the tree was a body. Oh, my gosh. So Steve decided to, to brush off the head. And, and see if he was alive or dead. And he realized that, that he was dead because he had, was, wasn't breathing. He, he had uh, a kind of a gray face. But as a trauma surgeon, he's trained to do certain things. And he went into this trauma mode. And he reached down to his neck and felt his carotid artery, which was he had a, he had a pulse. It was a very thready pulse. He could hardly tell he was alive, but he was alive. So Steve suddenly uh, you know, started to call out, help, help. One of the last skiers down the mountain heard his cry, came to his side. Steve said, go down and get the snow patrol as soon as you can, the ski patrol, and send him up here. This fellow's almost dead. About 15 minutes later, he saw the light from the from the, ski, the snowmobile, and the gurney was being pulled behind it. They loaded up this unconscious, uh, shocky skier, and they took him down to the lodge, and they had the ambulance waiting and whisked him off to the, uh, to the hospital. Steve, in the meantime, had used his jackets to cover the skier and did all the things that he needed to do, and he was shivering with both adrenaline and also cold. He got his clothes back on, zipped out as fast as he could to the, to the girls, which were still waiting on the other side of the grove of trees, and then skied down the mountain. There he got his reward, a cup of hot chocolate. Man. The next day, he called up the hospital and said, what happened to that skier? <clears throat> and they said... You won't believe this. The skier is perfectly fine. There's no frostbite. The leg that was broken that Steve actually splinted in the field with his underclothes and a tree branch was perfectly splinted. They didn't have to make any uh, uh, reset of the, of the bones. And uh, the, the skier was, was perfectly fine. And I said, Steve, how, how do you account for that? What, what, what happened there? Yeah. And he said, it's got to be someone from above because if I hadn't found that skier, he wouldn't be found until, until the next year when the snow melted. Good and he said, that day... Two people were saved. And I said, what do you mean two people were saved? And he said, the skier was saved, but I was saved too. And I said, well, why, why were you saved, Steve? And he said, I've been living with the tragedy of my father. My father and I were skiing in Michigan two years before. He arrested on the snow, snow oh, field. Oh, my gosh. And I couldn't save him. We did CPR for, for an hour, and, we, and, and I, I lost his, we lost his life. And I blamed myself for his death. So ever since then, I've carried that guilt with me that he that I was responsible for his death. And he said, this event, this deja vu experience that I had, taught me and showed me that, that I'm not in charge of life and death, that someone else is, and I got a second chance. And I said, Steve, do you think your dad was, was in, in cahoots with all, the, all this mm -hmm. from above? And he said, there's no question he was. So two people were saved that day. And that, I, I love that story. It's, it's got lots of, lots of meaning, meaning to it, I think. It certainly does. Uh, it, it shows that there was something that there are many things in my opinion dr scott that happen to us on an e on a daily basis that we have no idea about and that life is much more spiritual if you'll excuse the expression than we will ever understand uh, except for people like yourself and these other fine doctors who have these experiences and who know firsthand that there is something called divine intervention and that there is t more to life than the physiology that we all under that we all believe we understand and that was one of the points we're trying to get out with the book rob mm -hmm. and that is there is, look around you there are little coincidences and big yeah. coincidences happening to you every day 
and and pay attention to those. And some you know some of those are not coincidental. Some of those are are truly divine intervention. I, I had a crazy experience getting into medical school. Did I? Did you know how I I finally got into medical school? No, sir. I I I was not a great student in in college, and so I majored in economics and art. I was a potter, and and then after I graduated, I decided to go back to 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 medical school. And I didn't have the grades. I didn't have the prerequisites. And I had to take some night classes, and, and I, I'd been working on this for about three years. And finally, the last year, my wife and everyone said to me, okay, Scott, you probably have one more year to, to try to do this, and if you don't get into medical school, you better get a real job and get on with life. So I had this last year to, to, uh, to, to get the prerequisites, and the one I needed to get was organic chemistry. So organic chemistry was offered in the town that I was working in, which was perfect, Aurora, Illinois. I enrolled in the class. There were lots of books in the library. I got one of the books and went to the class. There were only three students in the class, and they canceled the class. Oh. I was heartbroken because this, this was only offered in one other school in the, in the state, and that was Roosevelt University in downtown Chicago. So I zipped down there the next day. And I thought, well, I'll just enroll in organic chemistry there. I'll be all set. I got to the head of the line with the registrar, and she said, I'm sorry, the organic chemistry class is filled. We opened up a second class, and that's filled. And we have nine students in the waiting list, all with the same story that you have. My heart sunk. I thought, my life is over. I'll never become a doctor. I don't know what to do. So I said, who makes the ultimate decision about organic chemistry uh, enrollment? And she said, it's the professor. And I said, well, where does the professor live? And she said, the third floor, room 303. So I ran up the stairs, stumbling half the way, got to a room that was loaded with students. All right, what we're going to do here, Scott, is we're going to do a a bit of a cliffhanger because I do have to take my news break at the bottom of the hour. Exxon Nation, our guest this hour is Dr. Scott Kolbaba. He is the author of Physicians Untold Stories. His website is www.physiciansuntoldstories.com. Don't forget, Exo Nation, um, if you're interested in having a one hour, one time radio show, if you have something that will help the people out there, if you have a special message that you'd like to get across, if you want to talk about the homeless, the needy, the hungry, whatever, as long as it's positive, go to www.f what is it? FTPN.com. For the people, broadcast network.com. Fill out a submission form, and one of the segment producers will get in touch with you. No, there's no cost to this. It's our way of paying forward. After all, this is the X Zone, a place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. My name is Rob McConnell. Don't go away. Welcome back, everyone. This is the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell. We're coming to you from our broadcast center and studios in Crystal Beach, Ontario, Canada. Once again, to visit uh, the Exxon Broadcast Network website where you can find out about all the shows we have available to you 24-7, 365, around the world, go to www.xzbn.net. And for the Exxon TV channel, it's on Simul TV at www.simultv.com. Dr. Scott Cole Baba is our special guest. He is the author of Physicians Untold Stories, his website, physiciansuntoldstories.com. Um, when you're talking to these patients about their experiences, uh, do any of them or have any of the doctors talked to you about dreams that they have had that may have foretold about the events that they were going to be part of? Yes, I've... There are a couple of doctors that, that had some really incredible dreams, and mm-hmm. one of those is uh, Rich Jorgensen, who is a, a, a surgeon. And uh, Rich uh, was talking to one of his friends, and uh, she was kind of a, 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 a hippie 70s type, and she said, you know, the spirit will, um, will uh, allow you to tell your dreams to a person that, that uh, you dreamt about, and you need to do that because that's a way of... of of uh, them communicating uh, with someone, and Rich thought that was an interesting idea. But, you know, he couldn't remember many dreams that he had. But one night he had this most incredible dream. He dreamt 
Uh, it was a, it was kind of a, a a bad dream. He dreamt that one of his good friends, Judge Glasso, who was a prominent judge in the in the Illinois area, uh, had died of a heart attack, and mm-hmm. and he could see him in in the in the casket in the funeral home. He could see people crying all around. It was just one of those dreams. Rob, have you had, ever had a dream that you woke up and you you couldn't get it out of your mind because it was just a phenomenal uh, dream? Definitely. And so, uh, Rich kept thinking about this dream and he thought about this friend of his that said you have to tell people and he was mm-hmm. very hesitant to tell his best friend that he th- he saw him dead in his dream but he had to call him up he called him up and very hesitantly said you know judge i i had a dream about you last night and i dreamt that you were dead well the <laughs> judge kind of laughed about that that's kind of a preposterous dream and rich said well you know i'd like you to do one thing for me if you could just go get a physical you probably haven't had a physical for a while and the, the judge said no i haven't so Rich said, get a physical, and I'll be very happy then if you get their physical. So the judge went to get a physical. He had a complete exam with EKG and labs and x-rays mm-hmm. and so forth. Everything was perfectly fine. So he called up Dr. Jorgensen and said, Rich, okay, I did what you said. I'm, the doctor said I'm going to be perfectly fine, and don't worry about me anymore. And Rich got this sick feeling in his stomach, you know, like he he – the dream was so powerful right. that he said, Judge, I need to have you do one more thing. I dreamt that you had a heart attack. Would you please see a cardiologist? <laughs> and the judge says, come on, Rich. You know, I did all you said I, I needed to do, the right. doctor and so forth and so on. It turns out that he did see the cardiologist. The cardiologist put him on a stress test, which he failed very badly. Uh, and then uh, admitted him to the hospital right away, did an angiogram, and he had multiple coronary uh, lesions and oh what's God. called a widow maker. Right. Widowmaker is that one main artery that supplies most of the heart with blood. He would have been dead within a few weeks or months had he not had that done. The next day, they decided to do a bypass much sooner than they would normally because they were afraid he would die of a heart attack if they didn't. They did the bypass. He did. He was, he was very successful. It literally saved his life. He lived for many, many years after that, uh, perfectly healthy, and about a thousand games of golf with Rich Jorgensen later. He was uh, was was great. What a story. What what a what a dream! And so I think we all have dreams sometimes that mm-hmm. uh, if they're if they're really powerful, we just need to pay attention to what what we dreamt. Now before we went to the commercial break with the news, we were talking about how you got into medical school, and you were running upstairs to room mm-hmm. three hundred three to see the professor yep. because he had the ultimate okay or he had the ultimate ruling who got in and who didn't. So please continue that story. Well, I was I, I got up there, and, and, and the, if I didn't get this class, I would not become a doctor because uh, I had one this last year mm-hmm. to finish up. There was only organic chemistry was only rec- prerequisite I needed. And if I didn't take that, I'd have to get a regular job and give up my hope. So I got to this room where there were a bunch of students who were asking about the same thing that I was. Can I get into the class? And I must have looked really sad to the secretary, and I said, I just need 30 seconds of the professor's time. And she said, okay, you can go to the little ante room there where the two professors that are teaching the class are talking. And I, I, sat, I sat outside the room. The door was paper thin. I could hear the professors talking about how they didn't have any books. They looked all over for, for textbooks, and in those days, they didn't have computer textbooks, mm-hmm. so they had to get the hard copy books and they had none of the books for the new class the 30 students that they opened up the class for they didn't know what they were going to do because the class started the next day so the one professor left i walked in to, to talk with the professor that could make that decision and i said listen i i want to you know i pleaded my case and he said you know look at this room out there everyone wants the same thing you do i'm very sorry i just can't accommodate you and about that point i knew this was my <laughs> this was my life on the line <laughs> so i said to him if i can get you the books for your class Will you let me in the class? And all of a sudden, he took a very great interest. He opened his eyes. He looked up at me. His eyebrows went up, and my heart was in my throat by this point, beating as hard as it could. And he said, it was a long pause. And finally, he said, can you get me 30? And I said, more. It was another long pause. And then he said, you're in. Now, what are, what are the odds that I could be there at that very moment when the two professors were talking about getting uh, books and the and the trouble they'd had with getting books where only I could help them and only they could help me. But how ca- how could you get the 30 books that they couldn't? They had the books in Aurora University where I w- the class was dropped. Oh. They had thousand they had about 30 or 40 books on the shelves when they canceled the class all the books were still in the library and I knew that and they didn't. Wow. So I got in and it was I, I didn't realize at the time, but that truly was some, some divine intervention that allowed me to get into that class, get into medical school, because had I missed that by 30 seconds, mm-hmm. I, would, I, wouldn't have, I, would, I would have been a different person. 
What do you say to people that that you meet and you know you they find out who you are, the book that you read? What are some of the most interesting questions that you get from the public? Um, you know the the public uh, and and especially my patients to whom mm-hmm. I like to tell these stories have been very very positive and very supportive. Uh, I've I've received literally no criticism from any of my patients or any of my friends or anyone, basically. And, and that was shocking to me, that people say that these stories give me hope, they give me uh, peace, they, uh, they renew my, my sense there's something else out there. So it has been very positive. And in addition to that, many patients will tell me their own story. They'll say, listen, I've got, I've got a story like that too that I've never told anyone. Yeah. And, and let me tell you, and I've heard, some, I've heard some incredible stories from patients. And thank goodness they feel okay to tell those stories now where they didn't before. Is there a common thread that you've seen between the doctors who, who tell you their, their stories about their patients? Uh, because this seems like these are very special members of not only the Western medical profession, but of society itself. You know, I, I looked for that. I looked to see, are these spiritual people? Mm-hmm. Are these religious people? Are they, are, do they have some, some characteristic in common? And I would say no. Uh, these, these stories and these experiences have happened to doctors that, that are never go to church, that, that, that don't have a belief system. Uh, these have happened to very, very spiritual and very religious people. So it's all a whole spectrum. And I think uh, that whatever... Uh, I think that, that the divine intervention uh, can happen to any of us, whatever our belief system is. And it has changed the number of doctors uh, and changed their lives when they've had an experience like this. You can imagine if you've had something like this happen to you, you're a different person after that. So it's all spectra of, of doctors. How have these experiences changed the lives of patients? Well, I think what many doctors do, and my partner is is a good example of this, John Bourne. Mm -hmm. Um, John will say, when I get that little voice in the back of my head, I listen to that. And I think uh, he and many other doctors that get that little premonition will listen to that. Now, you can't order crazy tests and things that don't make any sense. Right. But, you know, for example, he had a patient the other day who he was clearing for for a pre-op for a total joint surgery, and he does a lot of that. And he had this after they cleared the person uh, that day, he, he went home and he had this little naggy thought in the back of his head, maybe I should do a stress test on this guy. You know, maybe I wonder if I should do something like that. And he said, you know, that's that little voice. And he knew he had to do something. So he did a stress test. He failed it. The guy ended up with bypass surgery, like the one that the Dr. Jorgensen was involved right. with. And it saved his life because he had severe coronary disease. And had he gone to surgery, he may have had a heart attack and, and died from that. So I think the doctors are paying attention in, in many cases to those little thoughts, uh, their little premonitions. And they may just be, some of them are from experience, but some of them I think are from, from something above that, that, that helps us to accomplish what we want to accomplish. You know, I, I can attest personally to that, that intuition, that gut feeling. I was a police officer and criminal investigator for a number of years. And that inner voice, that gut feeling is real. You is. need to follow it. You know, and so many times I, I, you know, I talked to colleagues of mine who said, you know, I should have followed that gut feeling. And I learned at a very early stage in my career in law enforcement that it's there, it's real, follow it. Yeah, we had a doctor that told me that uh, he was leaving the office after seeing his patients for the day, and he mm-hmm. had this feeling that he had to call. He was late for late for, for dinner, as many of us always are, and the wife, I'm sure, <laughs> sitting home a little bit pre- perturbed with him, like uh, many of us uh, uh, face when we get home late. And he had this feeling he had to talk with this this one patient for some Scott, reason. I'm going patient. to have to do it to you again, darn it. I've got to take another break. My producer just okay. uh, told me. Dr. Scott Cole, Baba, and I will be back as we wrap up this hour here in the X-Zone from our broadcast center and studios in, Hem- in uh, Crystal Beach, Ontario, Canada. For more information about Dr. Scott Cole Baba, how you can get a copy of his book, Physicians Untold Stories, visit his website, www.physiciansuntoldstories.com. I'm Rob McConnell. We'll wrap up this hour. Don't go away.
And welcome back, everyone. Uh, this is the Exxon. I'm Rob McConnell. We're coming to you from our broadcast center and studios in Crystal Beach, Ontario, Canada. Now, before I get back to our guest this hour, Dr. Scott Cole Baba, who is the author of Physicians Untold Stories, I would just like to remind everyone that what we've decided to do here at Realmer is, is pay things forward. Um, you're probably saying, what's that all about, Rob? Well, it's very simple. We've been doing this. We've been doing our show and and the network now for 30 years. We decided that there's a lot of negativity in the world, and there's a lot of people who write us, you know, emails and call us and share their ideas, and, and the majority of them are super. So what we decided to do is give these people who have ideas, just like yourself who's listening right now on how to make this a better world, You've never had the opportunity of getting your message out there. So what we're doing is we are giving one, a one-time, one-hour radio show to people who have these ideas, who want to get a message out there, who want to make a positive change in this world of ours. Now, all you need to do to participate is go to www.ftpbn. That's the for the people broadcast network dot com that's ftpbn dot dot com there's a very simple submission form there fill out the submission form send it to us one of our producers will go over it and um, if it fits the criteria of what we're looking for we'll be in touch with you and we'll set up a date and time where we will give you your very own one time one hour radio show that's our way of paying things forward because you never know somebody may have a solution to a problem out there but nobody wants to listen we'll give you that opportunity and like i said no obligation to you whatsoever we will do the production we will do the marketing we will do the promoting we will do the syndication and we'll also do the distribution our way of saying thank you and paying forward www.ftpbn.com Dr. Scott Colbab is our special guest. He is the author of PhysiciansUntoldStories.com. Uh, no, he's the author of Physicians Untold Stories. His website is PhysiciansUntoldStories.com. First of all, Dr. Scott, thank you ever so much for coming on the show. It's a great pleasure talking to you. And, and thank you and the other doctors who've shared, who've given you the permission to share these wonderful stories. And, I, and you know, I can only imagine how these stories have changed so many lives. They were courageous doctors to do this. I agree. Um, you know, with Christmas uh, coming up, could you tell us about Mary's Christmas Carol? Sure. This is a good one. This is a Scrooge uh, story uh, all over again. Uh, Dave Mokel, who's the one that uh, I told you about earlier, that came up to me in the uh, hallway of the mm-hmm. hospital and grabbed me and pulled me into a room to tell me this story. This is this is his story. And Dave uh, was operating on one of my patients. Now, Mary was a real curmudgeon. That's a medical term for a person that you don't like to see in your office very often because she never had anything good to say. You were, why were you late? Why didn't oh, you my fill goodness. my prescription? You know, there's some people that you see on your schedule and you say, oh no, we don't have to deal with Mary again. So, so you've met my mother, I see. <laughs> well, there are a few patients like this. <laughs> and so Dave was operating on Mary on her ankle. And uh, in the middle of the, just before they actually put her before they started the surgery, they put her to sleep. They administered some antibiotic, and she arrested. She had a, a code. She stopped breathing. Her heart stopped. She was basically dead. And they found out later it was the antibiotic that they administered. And so when they call a code in the operating room, everyone from the operating rooms the next door rushes in, and they started to do CPR, chest compressions. And there was a guy that was had particularly red hair underneath his operating cap that was doing the CPR uh, compressions. Dr. Mokel was in charge of the code. He wasn't doing adequately, uh, wasn't doing the compressions adequately enough to get perfusion. So Dr. Mokel asked him to step aside. He didn't. And codes are not poli- codes are not polite affairs. So he pushed the guy aside. He stumbled away, and Dr. Mokel started to do compressions and CPR. And that's about when the the, the patient started to come around again. Never woke up. But uh, her heart started and and everything seemed to come back. And then she went off to the ICU where the cardiologist uh, made the diagnosis of an allergic reaction. About three days later, when she was leaving the hospital, Dr. Molka came to talk with her about the uh, the uh, uh, post-rest care and so forth of her ankle, which we'd never operated on. 
And she said, thank you for saving my life, Dr. Mogul. And he said, that's, you know, just a, he's a very humble guy. That was just a, a team effort. We did it. Oh, no, she said, I saw you push that guy with the red hair aside, and I saw you start, start doing compressions, wow. and that's when I came back. Well, doc, Dr. Mogul got weak knees and had to sit down at that point. He was late for work, but he, uh, he decided to sit down and listen to the story. And, she's, and he said, well, how did you know that? And she said, when I arrested, I rose to the top of the room and I could see everything that happened. And she named dozens of things that, that no one could have mentioned. The color of the nurse's dress, the, the, uh, the color of the stethoscope, the, you know, the number of people that were there. And then she recognized some individuals that were there and so forth. And Dr. Mokel said, well, that's, that's incredible. And, and, then, and then Mary said, in addition to that, when I was, when I was there doing that, my grandmother, who had been dead for many years, came to me and told me that I needed to be a good and kind person. And if I was, there would be a special place in heaven for me. And then uh, the grandmother left and she went back into her body when her heart started to, to beat again. Dr. Mulkel said, this, you know, this is an incredible story. And he tried to, tried to reason how scientifically this could happen, and he just couldn't come up with a scientific explanation. This was just an out-of-body, uh, near-death experience. And afterwards, um, Mary, I saw Mary in the office. She brought us cookies. She was the nicest person wow. in the world. She had totally turned her, her life around. She was kind and gentle to her, all of her relatives and her parents. She didn't live for a very long time after that because she had multiple medical problems and diabetes oh, and so no. forth. But the time that she was on Earth, she was the kindest, most wonderful person. And I call this Mary's Christmas Carol because she truly had a Scrooge experience where she, was, she went from being unkind to the most kind and loving person that, that you can imagine. And it, that reminded me of the essence of Christmas. Isn't that wonderful? It's never too late, is it, Doctor? No, it, it isn't. It isn't too late. Um, touching briefly on, on out-of-body experiences and, and near-death experiences, based on the people that you've talked to, what happens when they experience a near-death experience? Do the stories vary, or is it basically the same storyline? You know, Rob, I've been very surprised. I didn't know anything about these kinds of events and experiences, mm -hmm. and I, you know, they don't you don't learn about this kind of stuff in medical school. Right. And after hearing these experiences, I started reading other books and other uh, and listening to other people talk about their near death experiences mm -hmm. or their out of body experiences or their experiences with death or people coming back to help and so forth. And I was surprised to find out that many, many people have had very similar experiences. Yeah. I thought the doctors were very unique in, this, in the stories that they had, and they have some very unusual stories. But many of these stories are very similar to the stories of other people and other cultures and uh, other professions. And, and uh, so I was very surprised that these kinds of things happen over and over, and they're very similar. It, uh, well, that was very surprising and shocking to me. What has been your... your your most significant revelation since, since working on this project, publishing this book. And I understand there, there's another book coming out. Yes, there is. What, what has yes. been your, your most significant life-changing experience that, or story that you've had? Or, or what, is, what is it that has really cemented the belief in what you do and, and your desire to get it out there to the masses? I think there were probably two experiences that I had. <clears throat> the, uh, the one I can think of uh, was the near death of my daughter. Oh, my daughter, nice. Lucci, is a show choir girl, and so she dances and sings on, mm -hmm. on stage in high school. And they took a bus to uh, Onalaska, Wisconsin, and it was about a five-hour drive from Chicago. Uh, they left about an hour before we did, and about halfway through, Lucci called me up and said, there was a little fire, <clears throat> fire on the bus. And it's not no problem. We're okay. And, and uh, she sounded a little strange to me, but I didn't think too much of it. We hung up, and about an hour later, we came across uh, a, an area of the expressway that had lots of police cars and fire trucks, and there was this huge flaming structure off to the side. It was a bus. Oh, no. It was Lucci's bus. My wife almost freaked out. She said, that's Lucci's bus. It was totally on flame, uh, on, on fire. The whole thing was incinerated. And evidently, what happened was the rear tire of their bus uh, uh, was was a uh, became a flat tire, mm -hmm. and the rubber uh, was hitting the the side of the bus and, and caught it on fire. And they pulled off, 
and the girl, the, the bus behind them started texting all the girls in the in the first bus that their bus was on fire. They had to get out. Well, the, the fire went very quickly. <clears throat> the bus filled with smoke. The girls only had one escape exit to the in the front of the bus, and so they had to line up. My daughter Lucci was in the back of the bus. The flames were all on the side of the bus. They were going underneath the bus. The bus was filled with smoke. The girls were coughing and screaming. They were trying to get out of the bus before they all burned up. The flames were getting larger and larger. And then the people in the bus behind that said there was something really strange that happened. All of a sudden, it was like a blanket, like a, like a giant hand went over the bus. The flames died down and allowed every single girl to jump off the bus without being harmed at least. When the last girl jumped off the bus, there was a roar of flames that came through the bus and burned everything in the bus. Oh, my Lord. Had Lucci uh, been in the bus, she would have been killed. And that was the most, one of the most moving experiences that uh, I've ever had. Scott I, interest- I, I, Scott, I know that we've got many more stories uh, that we could share with the listeners, but unfortunately, we've run out of time for today. I'd love to have you back on any time your schedule allows, Scott. I, I admire the work that you do. I love what you're doing. So to you and the other practitioners in the medical community who allowed these stories to come forward and be known, thank you very much. Thanks for having me on, Rob. It's great to share these stories with you and your your listening audience. Thanks a lot, Dr. Scott. And ExoNation, once again, if you'd like more information about Dr. Scott Kolbaba, visit his website, physiciansuntoldstories.com. This ExoNation would make a wonderful Christmas gift because this is the season of miracles. I'll be back on the other side of this commercial break with the news at six and a half minutes past the top of the hour as we continue here in the X-Zone with yours truly, Rob McConnell, on the Talkstar Radio Network, Mutual Broadcast Network, X-Zone Broadcast Network, and Simul TV. Don't go away. (laughs) 